Lloyd Say found himself lying in the dirt. He was bleeding badly. He looked over and saw blood gushing from his brother's neck. They had both been shot by their own kin, and he wanted to know why. 12 hours earlier, he had just won the biggest stock car race in the sport's short history, and now he was dying in a feud over moonshine. You probably know that alcohol was illegal in the United States from 1919 to 1933, an era known as Prohibition. You might even know that a group of bootleggers went on to help found NASCAR. But the intertwined histories of moonshine and cars goes a lot deeper than that. It was four redneck rum runners in particular that basically invented engine mods and as a result brought both backwoods hooch and stock car racing to the masses. Who were they? And how did their efforts to outrun the law turn into a modern day racing behemoth? Grab a mason jar of white lightning and settle in because today on Past Gas we're talking about bootlegging and burnouts. This is the story of stock car racing's very first professional team. Ooh, that's a fast car. <laughs> no boy, that's a nice car. I feel like I'm drunk off this just reading this. <laughs> well, hopefully you're not because it is ten eighteen AM <laughs> on a Friday morning. Well No, Friday, you so. have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> This whole courtroom's got a problem. <laughs> that just reminds me of when quarantine first started. And like for the first two weeks, it was all like, no one's going to stop me from having a glass of wine at 2 p.m. I've got my robe on, you know. Uh, and then and, it got and, then you like gained 50 pounds. It got progressively worse yeah. from there. Yeah. Welcome to Pass Gas. I'm your host. <laughs> Wait, did Nolan it ever Sykes. get better? <laughs> Do we need to? Uh, it's it's going, you know, <laughs> it's going. <laughs> OK, we'll uh, talk after. Well, ap after the intro, we'll get back into that. Uh, yeah, I'm Nolan Sykes, your host, joined as always by my other two hosts. We got Joe Weber over there. Keep it you. And James Pumphrey. Because the buster kept me out of handcuffs. He didn't just <laughs> run back to the fort. The buster brought me back. What? <laughs> what? what? What is that? <laughs> that's that's from the the fifth movie. No, that's the first movie. That's the first movie. Yeah, when, oh, okay. after uh, they blow up the eclipse. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And Vin walks into the party, and Vince is like. Why'd you bring the buster back here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's because. right. Because <laughs> I love how it sounds like Vin Diesel's tongue is being swallowed every time he <laughs> says a line. Just going back to the, the drinking real quick. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, well, hey, you just, can have any beer you want as long as it's a Corona. Right? It, just, it hasn't been bad. I've just I've noticed that we have this really we got this really good bourbon. Uh, oh, yeah. For it is really celebrating. Good. It's so good. And I, you know, I only had like one glass, but for some reason, this bourbon just puts me in a certain state of mind. Where you text me at 10 p.m. about <laughs> wheels? Yeah. yeah, I text James <laughs> about putting some Euroline DHs on my Chrysler, which, uh, and then I woke up the next morning, thought back on, I was like, yeah, that would not look good. Yeah, just to be uh, clear, I am technically <laughs> Nolan's employment <laughs> boss. It's like yeah. me texting <laughs> Matt at 10 p.m. about wheels. Hey, well, my boss texts me weird TikToks at 10 p.m. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. <laughs> goes both I ways, love buddy. the TikToks, though. I and also, them. James, you're not just my boss, but you're my friend. Oh, so buddy. there you go. Uh, but last night, last night, I saw, I got served like an ad on YouTube. Mr. Peanut has like a new voice. Uh, yeah, I, I saw like, that tweet you had this morning. Yeah, I was like, Sh I should voice Mr. Peanut and like kind of like <laughs> just kind of got obsessed with the idea. I didn't text anybody about it. I I, I guess I texted the world with my Twitter account, but Mr. Yeah. Peanut has a new voice. Would you do like a classical, what do they call it, mid Atlantic accent? Or would you no. do like a normcore updated version? Well, see, that's the thing is like new the the in the the advertisement I saw is like Mr. Peanut just has like a normal normcore voice. Like not yeah. he, he doesn't sound like he wears a monocle at all. Is he still a baby? No, he's no, he's a oh, you know what? Maybe he's dad. He's <laughs> a millennial dad. Um, what? yeah, you know, a very strange choice. I like the classical Mr. Peanut, 
the very suave Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. Um, right. Kind of, yeah, I, I dig that vibe. Um, this new Mr. Peanut, I'm not not sure what's going on with it. So Robert Downey Jr. voiced Mr. Peanut from 2010 to 2013. Bill Hader Whoa. voiced Whoa. him from 2013 oh, to 2017. Yeah. But maybe you couldn't tell because that guy is a chameleon. He Dude, a he's chameleon. a chameleon. Yeah, right he's, he's got voices on lock, too. The new guy... Is this dude Keith Ferguson? Yes. He oh so he and he does uh like Lightning McQueen in some of the off extra. Yeah. Oh. Um. Okay. So he's like Cars a pretty movies. prolific voice actor. It looks like he's done a lot of stuff. Big time voice actor. Done a lot of stuff. Yeah. All right. So maybe I need to up my chops a little bit before I come for the king. That is Keith Ferguson. Uh, how would Damn you? It. How would you voice Mr. Peanut? Uh, hey kids, I'm Mr. Peanut. <laughs> Damn, dude, that's a that's a different thing. That's different. <laughs> yeah, that's uh like Fat Albert almost. No, I would just have my I, I just want to do my voice, you know. Yeah, just I, I just want to be Mr. like So I'm basically Mr. just a zillennial dad, Normcore zillennial dad. Like a chill like <laughs> central to southern California Mr. Peanut. <laughs> <laughs> that may or yeah. may not be a dad. That may or may not be a dad. Who you know, definitely exudes dad energy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, actually, in my in in the replies to my tweet, my buzz tweet last night, James, someone suggested that you be the new um, Colonel Sanders. Oh, I'd which love that. I am one thousand percent behind. Yeah. That is a love genius that. move. Howdy, y'all! When I eat this dang chicken, <laughs> I poop my pants. <laughs> I, I don't. Poop. No wait. When I eat this here, yeah, that's what he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I eat this here <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken with my seventeen, with my seven eleven, I'll learn it. <laughs> the number. When I eat this here <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken with my eleven signature secret spices, I don't sh my pants. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, very few people sh their pants after eating <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken. Cut. Cut. All right, we don't even need to mention if no one's in their pants, we don't need to mention it. How about I that? Just, I just thought it would be nice to highlight. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> a very small percentage of people actually no, no. their pants. Again, we don't eating. cut. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, unfortunately, this is not a fast food mascot podcast as much as I wish it was. This is a car podcast, so let's get to our story today. Oh, yeah, let's get back to the guy uh, bleeding to his death <laughs> right after the chicken. Let's do it. <laughs> Raymond Parks was born in 1914, just outside the dirt poor town of Dawsonville, Georgia. He grew up working on his grandparents' farm, which he hated. But at the age of 14, he had his first brush with the law, which fortuitously offered him a path to a brighter future. It was the height of prohibition, and the police arrested Parks while picking up a jar of illegal whiskey for his father. During his subsequent jail stint, Parks met a man who offered him a job making that same whiskey in the backwoods east of Atlanta. So as soon as they were both out of the slammer, Parks left his family's farm and joined the moonshine business. Parks was determined to escape the dead-end life of a farmhand and worked hard to ascend the bootlegging ladder. He started as a still hand mixing ingredients in bathtubs, but soon moved to Atlanta, where his uncle ran a part-time moonshine business out of his brand new gas station. Parks had recently bought a beat-up Model T with some of his still hand pay, so the opportunity combined his three new passions, booze, <laughs> driving, and making money. <laughs> Parks' uncle sold jars of the strong, clear backwoods whiskey known as White Lightning to restaurants and speakeasies around Atlanta. Raymond's job was to drive back to Dawsonville a few nights per week to pick up gallon-sized tins of white lightning from the manufacturers. Soon, Parks decided to go into business for himself and found he was really, really good at it. Within a few years, he had bought his uncle's service station, Moonshine Business, and even as a house while he was still a teen. Damn. Good for him, man. You know, we all wish to, to buy a house. Yeah. I, I guess I got to get into the moonshine business. Speaking of moonshine, I saw that PBR is making moonshine. I mean, it's mm. technically mm. whiskey, and they have to put on the label aged for five seconds because legally, Ugh. Ugh. if they didn't age it at all, 
it would be moonshine and not whiskey. So it looked like rubbing alcohol. It was completely clear. I'll, I'll try some and get back to you, Joe. Yeah. In the mid-1930s, unskilled workers typically earned less than $20 per week. A quote-unquote tripper, as the moonshine smugglers were known, could earn twice that in one trip. And many would make multiple trips per night. That made these jobs in demand, despite inherent dangers with the law and the rocky roads they would speed down during the middle of the night with no lights on. This is like Redneck the Wire. <laughs> <laughs> Parks liked to keep it in the family. He hired two of his younger cousins to be his primary drivers, Lloyd Say and Roy Hall, both from Dawsonville. The two cousins became known as the most skilled trippers around by fellow moonshiners and the local authorities. Say was quiet, respectful, and polite, but drove like hell. In particular, he perfected a move called the bootlegger's turn, a 180-degree handbrake maneuver used for speeding away from roadblocks before the cops could even get their cars in gear. One tax agent later confirmed that Say was, quote, without a doubt, the best driver of his time. That's cool. That's cool to have the fuzz call you good at your job. Did they have <laughs> handbrakes back then, or was it foot? Yeah, they had a, fl they had a cutaway in the floor of their car and they put their feet down no no i'm saying it's <laughs> like a truck like it was like a a pedal oh yeah well at this oh, time they probably had the side brake well this is the you know mid 30s as well so i i, I think they probably had some sort of hand accessible mm. brake that just did the rear wheels i'm sure of it they had hills. <laughs> sure of it, are you sure they had hills in the 30s dude i don't know i don't know <laughs> Roy Hall, his cousin, on the other hand, was a brash, handsome, lead foot who took a more straightforward approach to tripping. Sounds familiar. Well, he never let up on the accelerator. Hall was known to take hairpin turns at full speed, despite a car full of sloshing whiskey. In one instance, a tax agent was pursuing Hall's Ford Coupe when the agent's car slid off the road into a rock pile and Hall got away. The next day, a huge bouquet of flowers arrived in the agent's hospital room, signed, The Coop. Damn. Hell yeah. <laughs> this should be a movie already. Why is this not a movie? There was kind of a bootleg, that Shia LaBeouf one. Yeah, Lawless with oh. Tom Hardy. Oh, that's cool. I got to see that. It's all right. As Parks and his cousins became bootleg kingpins, they started to draw more attention from federal authorities. Surprisingly, even after Prohibition was repealed, demand for corn whiskey continued to grow. And since bootleggers didn't pay taxes, the U.S. government was eager to stamp them out. So in 1934, the IRS created the Alcohol Tax Unit, a special group of moonshine hunters, also known as Revenuers. That's a cool name. Yeah. Revenuers. Revenuers. The Trippers versus the Revenuers quickly became the South's favorite rivalry since the Hatfields and the McCoys. Little kids around Georgia would play Trippers and Revenuers instead of <laughs> cops and robbers. Guys like Lloyd C. and Roy Hall became local legends, and the two sides' constant back and forth also turned into a game of body mod one-upmanship. What? They they got, like, hooks put in their backs and stuff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like hang from yeah. The ceiling. One of the I, one of the agents became the first like cat person and yeah. had a bunch of like beads put in their eyebrows. The first thing moonshiners had to learn was to carefully pack a load of glass jars into a Ford so they didn't crack on the rough country roads. Then they started ripping out their interiors to install huge tanks instead. Many whiskey cars had extra large springs installed in the rear suspension to help hide the extra weight added by 200 gallons of booze. Yeah, it's a dead giveaway if your trunk is like sagging super hard, you yeah. know? Dead giveaway. If you got a dead giveaway. If you got a, <laughs> like a, if you got a hot car yeah. and then the, the trunk is sagging, that's a dead giveaway. That's they a, know you're a moonshine. That's what you call dead a, giveaway. a dead giveaway. You know? Yeah. yeah, it's a dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. Uh, <laughs> the feds responded to tripper advances by installing pincer? Oh, that's cool. What? Is that how you say <laughs> little, it? Little pincer? claws. Yeah. Yeah, a yeah, little pincer, pincer. The feds responded to tripper advances by installing pincer devices on the front of their cars to snag the whiskey car bumpers before they could speed away. The bootleggers solved that problem by loosely attaching their fenders and bumpers with wire coat hangers so that they would fall off and tangle 
under the revenuer's car. That's amazing. That's sick, dude. It's like no so, it's it's almost like playful. Yeah, it's it's that like criminal playfulness. Yeah, you know so where think, it's like kind of malicious, but <laughs> still kind of funny at the same time. But law enforcement back then. And I guess now, but law enforcement back then was crazy, man. They just had Tommy guns. They were just like yeah. looting people. Thomas, the producer of this show, was named after a, a Thomas gun. Yeah, a Thomas <laughs> gun. <laughs> then things got straight up hillbilly James Bond. Revenuers took the fight up a notch by welding steel battering rams to the front of their cars. They'd try to catch a tripper on a curvy road and ram him on an angle so he'd spin off. In response, bootleggers started attaching canisters to their cars that would drop oil slicks or tire oh shredding God. tacks with the push of a button, or even traveling with blocker cars that would take the brunt of the revenue or punishment. Whoa. That's sick. Revenuers did not like these playful tactics much. They fought back by shooting out radiators. See? <laughs> yeah, man. They were like, all right, you know what? <laughs> not being cute. <laughs> <laughs> they fought back by shooting out radiators and tires or just blasting the car full of holes. And that's when whisk mechanics started welding steel plates on the side of their cars. Whoa. Clearly, the safest way to escape a revenuer was to outrun them. So that's what Lloyd C. and Roy Hall were known for. And that's what made Raymond Parks his moonshine fortune. But with the rise of the revenuer, they knew they needed their fast cars to get faster fast <laughs> enter red vote red vote spelled v-o-g-t was an irritable chain smoker and vocal anti-semite whose wife and kids openly hated him he was also a genius mechanic when he moved down to atlanta the bootleggers were in desperate need of someone to help them outrun revenuers vote was happy to be that guy Eventually, the revenue started going to him as well because he was the only one who could build cars fast enough for them to keep up. That's so cool. Just playing both sides of the coin. So you always come out on top. Yeah. It's like Dom and Fast and Furious. Whiskey mechanics elsewhere focused on disguising their cars or eluding the authorities with clever devices. Vote approached the job differently. He focused on making his cars strong enough to carry 200 gallons of liquor and fast enough to stay in front of federal agents. He had a saying, money equals speed. Nobody in Atlanta had more invested in moonshine than Raymond Parks, so nobody spent more money at Red Vote's garage than Raymond Parks. The garage was open 24 hours, and Vote was almost always there. He built a secret room behind a false wall where he would spend his nights tearing apart bootlegger engines and tweaking the engine with hot rod parts he ordered from California. He added extra carburetors to help the car inhale more fuel and air, and extra pipes to the exhaust manifold to help the engines exhale. He bored out the cylinders to fit wider pistons, then shaved the pistons down to save weight. He widened the intake and exhaust ports and adjusted the transmission gears to achieve maximum torque. In a signature trick, he blocked the cooling holes in a V8 block with pennies to help the engine heat up quicker and run faster. Whoa, this all seems like... It feels like the engine would blow up. Yeah, I'm not sure, especially on like long drives, I'm not sure what the benefit for blocked and cooling would be. He was also one of the only mechanics of his day to understand that a clean engine lasted a lot longer and ran a lot faster. He wore all white in his pristine shop, which his assistants swept and mopped constantly. Vote wouldn't even allow workers to use rags in certain areas because he worried that microscopic lint would besmirch one of his engines. This guy's awesome. Yeah. Well, well, except for that, the one, except for the the, the, the anti semite part. And it sounds yeah. like he wasn't very nice to his family. Yeah, he sounds like he was a jerk. Yeah. So, Vote eventually developed such a <laughs> reputation that he was hired to work for the winning team in the 1938 Indianapolis 500. But Vote's real love was Ford's, not open wheel cars. And lucky for him, the American South felt the same way. Through the aftermath of the Civil War and into the Great Depression, Southern folk had few entertainment options. The cities were spread out and attractions like baseball games or movie theaters were few and far between. So when moonshiners started gathering in fields to race their souped up Fords, it shouldn't be surprising that they quickly began attracting crowds. Hmm. Henry Ford was initially resistant to big engines. His Model T became the first popular mass market car on the strength of a four-cylinder engine. And that's the way he liked it. 
saying, quote, A car should not have any more cylinders than a cow has teats. <laughs> so six? What? How many teats does a cow have? Six? Or no, eight? that's four. What? Apparently it has four. All right, let me bing this real quick. Eleven teats. Eleven? Eleven? Yeah. I thought Look, cows had at, more than four. I'm Googling udders right Listen, now. Listen, guys, I guarantee that Henry Ford has seen more cow teats than either of you. Okay? The guy <laughs> probably owned cows. They got four. They got okay. four. Anyway, Bizarre. I think we can all agree, no matter what, using cow teats to say a number is normal. <laughs> Totally and cool. not a sign that you're freaking <laughs> super weird. Well, we know that he, we know for a fact that he's 69 with Thomas Edison regularly. Oh, yeah, dude. Of course. <laughs> Which is Everybody. we're not kink shaming there, but you no. know. But by the 1930s, the free market had other ideas. They wanted cars with cylinders of two teat cows. <laughs> When Model T sales started to sag like a cow's teat, Ford quickly pivoted to produce the Ford V8. It was the perfect car for trippers, mostly because a tuned-up V8 with a fearless driver could take windy mountain roads at 100 miles an hour plus. In fact, the famous bank robber Clyde Barrow of Bonnie and Clyde wrote to Ford that, quote, It don't hurt anything to tell you what a fine car you got in the V8. Shortly before, he was shot full of bullets while sitting inside of one. Oh. It turned out that Henry Ford's eight-teated cow also <laughs> made an excellent race car. At this point, most officially sanctioned auto races remained elitist, Kentucky Derby type events. But alongside the introduction of the V8, unofficial stock car races started popping up at converted horse tracks and fairgrounds across the South. And in 1938, stock cars began to truly catch fire. Both literally and figuratively. Wasn't the V8 just two four-cylinder engines bolted together? Or no? Am I misremembering I don't know if they're that? Bolted I'm together. not sure they're the technical specification, but I mean we're talking about the flathead Ford right here. Like yeah. this is the like you know, you see the deuce coupes around, they're usually running one of these. Like this is just the, a legendary engine. Mm -hmm. That year, 1938, two cities competed to become the center of stock car racing. One was Daytona, Florida, where a childhood friend of Red Vote named Bill France, remember that freaking name, organized a Labor Day race on the city's beach and road course. The second was Atlanta, where that same November, the first big race was run on Lakewood Speedway's treacherous red clay track. I'm just realizing how fitting this guy's name is for a uh, powerful guy that lives in the South, Red Vote. Red Red vote. Yeah. <laughs> the Atlanta event was the first big stock car race that included Raymond Parks, Red Vote, Loy C, and Roy Hall. Among the other drivers were a Mexican movie star named Ramon Cortez, a Cherokee mm. stunt driver who went by Chief Ride in the Storm. That's awesome. Yeah. And a driver out of Alabama named Red Byron. Uh, you know you're in the South when two of the characters in this story are named Red. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Red Byron's old Model A was wrenched by a one-legged mechanic <laughs> and had so many aftermarket parts that it barely qualified as a Ford. Love it. The Lakewood race was marred by caution flags and extreme dust to the point that promoters cut it short at the 135-mile mark. The out-of-towner Byron later insisted he had won uh, and that the organizers had lost track of how many laps he'd run. However... C took the checkered flag despite driving with a broken arm, and the quiet tripper who mastered the bootlegger's turn was named the world's stock car auto race champion. Dang, look at that. Started from the bottom. Now he's champion of the world, even though they've won, <laughs> they've run, they've run one race. <laughs> most importantly, yeah, champion of the world. Most of these guys are from Georgia. <laughs> Most importantly, both races drew huge crowds, validating the twin belief of Raymond Parks and Bill France that there was money to be made in pro stock car racing. With those two races, a sport was officially born. I just heard and uh, that sport was high lie. <laughs> <laughs> they developed it in the parking lot. <laughs> the world stock car champion thing reminds me of like when there's uh burger joints. There's uh, so many burger joints around LA where it's yes. like 
world famous cheeseburger. Yeah. And you're LA's like, best cheeseburger. It's like, who gave you that award? And <laughs> and it hasn't Greg, been updated on your sign since 1989. Greg said it was the best burger in LA. Greg went to Europe one time. So, <laughs> you know, the, you know. The, the place where they eat burgers all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Greg went on a student trip to Washington D.C. when he was in seventh grade. Yeah, um, so he's pretty cultured. Um, <laughs> so he knows, you know. We'll be right back with more of this story, but first, a word from our sponsors. Even though Vote soon introduced Raymond Parks and Bill France, the gulf between the Atlanta and Daytona racing scenes remained. France and his Daytona racers frowned on the continued illegal activities of the Atlanta crew, particularly Roy Hall, who could generally be relied on to spend about a quarter of the year in jail. <laughs> hey, you want to go to you want to go to Florida at the end of the year? Nah, man, probably going to nah, be in jail around then. That's my jail quarter. <laughs> <laughs> what state would you want to be in prison? Maine. Uh, whichever has the best prison system. You can't do any research, and you have to pick. Oh, Jesus. Um, um, I th- feel like Minnesota jails are probably pretty clean, and it yeah. like with a focus on being out in the yard and being healthy. I yeah, I'd say like maybe maybe Minnesota, mi- maybe like Vermont. Yeah, I'm going. Yeah, I'm going Vermont or Rhode Island. Ooh. Yeah. The Atlanta racers, on the other hand, sneered at France and his puritanical views. But both sides needed each other to fill out the ranks of their new sport. So the rivalry grew. C and Hall were so eager to top the Daytona racers that they began begging their cousin Raymond to outfit them with brand new 1939 Ford V8s. They probably sounded insane. Strictly stock races were still a rarity, meaning that most cars were secondhand and heavily modified. No one used new cars for racing, but Parks saw an opportunity. He agreed to finance the cars and cover travel costs in exchange for two-thirds of the prize money C and Hall won. He also painted the name of his more legitimate businesses on the sides of the cars. Hemphill Service Station, Parks Novelty Machine Company, and others. Vote agreed to be the official mechanic in exchange for free advertising, and thus they became the first professional stock car racing team. That's interesting that advertising was part of it from the beginning. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, man, because advertising is like half of NASCAR, Mm -hmm. uh, half of the NASCAR viewing experience. You can't watch a NASCAR race without it going to commercial after like five minutes. It's yeah, it's I mean, but like the cars, like compare a NASCAR livery to say, you know, like an F1 livery for sure. Lewis Hamilton's car doesn't look different from race to race to race whereas Bubba Wallace's car is different in almost every yeah. race it's a sport that like prioritizes advertising over most everything else I feel like yeah and and like it's run by the advertisers yeah big detergent runs it yeah <laughs> over the next few years C and Hall developed a weekend routine They've come down from Dawsonville with a trunk full of moonshine on a Friday night, then party into the morning of one of Atlanta's nightclubs. They'd caravan to Lakewood or Daytona or one of the other tracks around the south to race on Saturday afternoon. Then they'd load up their cars with sacks of sugar and take them back home Sunday night to make more moonshine. Nice. That's a good hustle. In addition to being cousins, C and Hall were also best friends. Oh, They were best friends, James. Got it. Once they started racing, they called themselves the team but there were differences the easygoing c was the favorite of fans and newspapers which dubbed him the atlanta speedster oh i would have called him c breeze oh, oh hell yeah dude i would i would i would call him see you later see you later <laughs> and then if i were him i'd be like now you see me now you don't <laughs> Magic i call man. him i call him cianara we're so good at branding like if we would have been around back then we would have Oh, we These guys would have been huge. It. Yeah, for sure. Hall, on the other hand, had a rougher reputation due to his more extreme run-ins with the law. The papers helped him cultivate that image by describing him as a, quote, dirt smeared windburn Georgian. They nicknamed him <laughs> Reckless Roy. And his exploits on and off the track inspired songs by Blind Willie McTell and Jim Croce. 
Very cool. Bye, bye, reckless Roy. <laughs> <laughs> you jab a V8 full and you're a bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> Your best friends with your cousins, yeah. And tell him this will be the day I win the race. <laughs> this will be the day I win the race. <laughs> At Alice's restaurant. Hey. Uh. <laughs> After C took the unofficial championship in 1938, the 1939 stock car season was all about Roy Hall. He took win after win in Atlanta, Daytona, and pretty much anywhere else on the circuit. He may have even won some races that he didn't officially drive in. A part-time racer named Bad Eye Shirley. I love that. <laughs> later admitted that he had never actually been behind the wheel of a race car and that any time he was listed, it was actually Roy Hall racing during some legal problems. Whoa. You know how bad you got to be to ha pretend to be a dude named Bad Eye Shirley <laughs> so that you're allowed? <laughs> But still, there was no official organizing body for stock car racing, but newspapers and auto clubs generally agreed on Hall as the year's national champ. The following year, Bill France took the same unofficial title. This set up 1941 as the culmination of the Atlanta-Daytona rivalry. Nice. If Lloyd C., Roy Hall, and Bill France saw the 41 stock car season as a tiebreaker between their unofficial championships, then C. was the clear winner. He won eight major races that year, including his first victory at Daytona and a big Labor Day win at Lakewood. That one featured one of the strongest stock car lineups in the sport's short history, minus Hall, who was in Alabama trying to avoid one of his many arrest warrants. It was because of wins like those that France would eventually describe C as one of the best drivers in NASCAR history, despite the fact that he didn't live to drive in a sanctioned race. The night after his Labor Day win at Lakewood, C drove to his brother Jim's house back in Dawsonville to stay the night. Both Lloyd and Jim were awoken at 2 a.m. by a knock on the door. It turned out to be their cousin and part-time business owner, Woodrow, demanding that he and Lloyd go for a ride. Lloyd and Woodrow had recently bought a load of sugar for the moonshine stills together, in which Lloyd loaned Woodrow cash. To even the deal, Woodrow told Lloyd to put the next load on his credit account at a different store. Now, he was angry. He thought that Lloyd had overcharged the account, and he wanted to settle up. Ooh. Yeah. Jim was suspicious of Woodrow and insisted on accompanying them. Oh, God, man, this guy's your cousin, dude. It's your kin. Yeah. I do not like where this is going. No. So all three set out in Woodrow's Model A. Woodrow soon turned towards his father's house, claiming he needed to add water to the radiator. But when they arrived, he began yelling and accused Lloyd of stealing from him. Lloyd denied it, at which point Woodrow ran around to the front of the car and took a gun from inside the engine compartment. Seems like a dangerous place to keep a gun, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It gets really hot in there. Yeah. You know, heat has some interesting effects on bullets. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's where I'd keep my gun. No, I wouldn't keep my gun in there. No, no, no. That's for sure. I do feel like Job would keep a gun in the engine compartment. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's just, fine. <laughs> dude, it's fine. He's like, oh, uh, yeah. Just let me check the oil real quick. And then you're like, that eh, seems like something he would do. Yeah. And he's like, ha, gotcha. And then it slips out of his hand because it's covered in oil. <laughs> Where would you guys keep a gun in a car if you had to like trick someone? Trick someone. Um, um so Volkswagen Golfs and Jettas, you yeah. can get a German police door. They use them as police cars. So there's like uh like you know like the like on a door panel, there's like the little pocket on the bottom sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can get those with a gun holster in them. That's Whoa. pretty sick. That's yeah, cool. so I would get one of those in the golf, and I'd I'd hit the bags, and they'd be like, S and people would be like, "Dude, whoa, that's so sick!" And I'd be like, "Ah, gotcha." Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's I would trick me for sure. I would uh, I the night before I would go and put a nail on the road, and then <laughs> okay. I would I'd take my forerunner and be like, hey, "Let's go." Uh, it's 2 a.m. Let's go to the beach. <laughs> and then I'd drive you guys like, okay. down down that road. Us? Yeah. Both because you you guys are my cousins in this situation. Right, okay. right. I mean, we uh, double cross cousins you. anyway. Yeah. yeah, we double cross you. And and then I uh you guys double cross me, so I'm like, let's go to the beach, it's 2 a.m. 
drive down this road, run over the the nail that I had set the day before. <laughs> you know exactly where it is. And be like, oh, bup, 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 bup. I got to pull over. Uh, and then instead of a spare tire, I'd have a big shotgun. And I'd be like, yeah. crank, crank, crank. Bang. And then drop. You know what I'm doing? I'm not changing the tire. I'm changing your life. <laughs> <laughs> blow my dong off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all about aiming at the dong. And you're like, where is she? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> where is the fat man? And you're like, what are you talking about? It's 2 a.m. So he got the gun out of the engine compartment and then proceeded to slap and pistol whip Lloyd until Jim stepped between them and Lloyd scrambled away. Woodrow fired his pistol into Jim's ah. neck, then turned and shot Lloyd through the heart. Oh, oh, wow. As he bled on the ground, Lloyd asked why his cousin had shot him. He goes, God damn you. You know what I shot you for. Then Lloyd C. gasped out his final words. Tell Raymond. He couldn't finish the sentence. Woodrow found the cash prize from Lakewood in Lloyd's pockets and took the money he thought he was owed. Sadly, both cousins were bad with numbers, and Woodrow's trial would later reveal that the dispute actually came down to a difference of five cents. Oh, my Dang. God. Woodrow. At that trial, witnesses and lawyers also speculated that the whole argument was actually over a woman and the sugar was just a cover story. Woodrow claimed that the entire act was in self-defense. But Jim C. survived his bullet to the neck. What? Wow. His testimony ultimately led to Woodrow's conviction. Oh, my Holy God. Wow, man. Dang, all that for, for nothing. Some sugar money. Yeah. Sugar money, man. Sugar money and a sugar mama. <laughs> a little sugar money and a sugar baby. You know what I mean? Yep. The murder of Lloyd C. shook the world of stock car racing. Bill France and his Daytona Cruise general dislike of the Atlanta trippers turned racers was validated. So were the civil interest groups, political bodies, and police departments that had grown to dislike the noisy, rowdy sport as a whole. Atlanta area fans were devastated by the death of their favorite racer and turned out in droves for the Lloyd C. Memorial Race on November 2nd, 1941, which was organized by Parks, Vote, France, and others in the racing community. Bad Eye Shirley was on the starting line, or rather, Roy Hall, racing in disguise once again to commemorate his friend. After the race, Hall was awarded the 1941 championship, which would have been seized had he lived. The memorial would turn out to be the last major stock car race before World War II suspended the sport for five years. The National Office of Defense Transportation, which was created to coordinate all transportation inside the United States during the war, banned sport racing almost immediately after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Raymond Parks, still only 27 years old, was drafted and shipped off to Europe, where he supervised a unit of trucks and managed to survive the Battle of the Bulge. Wow. Red Vote was too old to be drafted and instead got a job as an army mechanic, quite fitting. His 24-hour garage's specialty transitioned from whiskey race cars to military vehicles. Roy Hall somehow managed to duck the draft just like he ducked most other authorities. I feel like there could have been some redemption for Roy Hall had he fought. <clears throat> After the war ended and stock car racing resumed in 1945, Hall beat out Bill France for his third unofficial national championship. But at the end of the 1946 season, in which he finished second, legal troubles ended his career for good when he was sentenced to six years in prison for his role in a bank robbery. This guy... It's like Place Beyond the Pines, right? Mm -hmm. Like, this guy just can't help himself from being a criminal, despite having a pretty good sidekick as being a really great racer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe he's just an adrenaline junkie. Maybe. He needs to get his fix. Without C and Hall, Parks had to find new partners for his racing ventures, or more accurately, just wait for two specific people to find him. One was Red Byron, the driver who claimed that Lloyd C.'s first title actually belonged to him way back in 1938. Byron had sustained an injury during his own World War II service that left his left leg pretty much useless. Parks and Vogt hired him to be their new driver anyway, and he immediately proved he could still drive by winning in his first race. His left leg. Wow. Yeah, how so do he's you... driving with one right foot. That's you pretty could crazy. Do it. With, with a clutch, too, though? 
dude, our one of our editors, uh, or I guess one of our lead editors here at Donut, Zach, dropped yeah. a knife on his foot one oh. night a couple weeks oh. ago. He got a surgery, and his his foot is in like a kind of cast gauze situation right now. But he drove to work yesterday in his Z3, which is a manual, mm-hmm. and it's his it's his it, it's his left foot, right? It's his left no, it's foot, his right foot, or it's right foot. The gas foot. I have no idea how he did it. Oh my god! So it's possible. We'll get back to more past gas, but right now, a word from our sponsors. The other person who sought out Parks was Bill France, who in 1947 invited Parks to be among three dozen guests at the Streamline Hotel in Daytona Beach, where together they created the rules and regulations for the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, a name suggested by Red Vote. And a list of rules that would change so many times, all the time, so much... (laughs) That it's almost impossible to be a fan of the sport. (laughs) Raymond Parks and the Reds, Vought and Byron, won the first ever title in NASCAR history by taking the modified series championship in 1948. They repeated in 1949, this time in the new strictly stock series, which went on to become today's NASCAR Cup series. Many of Vought's signature modifications were made illegal under NASCAR rules, but he continued tinkering under a new mantra... Quote, it's not cheating if you don't get (laughs) caught. As NASCAR grew, France tried hard to bury stock car racing's bootlegger past in an effort to legitimize the sport with a broader audience. But including Lloyd C.'s unofficial one race championship in 1938, 12 titles were handed out by Southern stock car racing organizations between 1939 and 1949, and nine of them were won by moonshiners. What started as a loose collection of lead-footed outlaws figuring out the best way to escape the cops is now an entire stock car racing industry. The France family, which still owns NASCAR, is worth an estimated $5 billion because of it. For some people, stock car racing, and especially southern stock car racing, is practically a religion. Those folks owe a huge debt to Raymond Parks, Red Vote, Roy Hall, and Lloyd C. And you know what? I bet there are still moonshiners out in the backwoods near Dawsonville, brewing up corn whiskey and outrunning the feds every once in a while. If any of you guys know them, uh, send some li- white lightning our way. Uh, I know one. I have his phone number. Well, send that phone number my way. Discovery had a show about it. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I like that show. It's pretty gnarly to go out in the woods and, and build a hardcore like copper still. And just have to go back and not tell anyone about it and go cook your whiskey and let it age and stuff. I think I would be a terrible moonshiner because I would just want to talk about it all the time. Like, yeah, all my hobbies and interests. And you would be like friends with cops too down there too. And you'd be like, ah, man, I really want to tell you a story, but uh, I just can't. I I just like want to tell you about something really cool that happened last night. Well, that is the story of the Moonshiners. I, you know, a lot of NASCAR makes sense now that I know Uh that there are two wings of it, basically, and that the more clean cut Daytona wing won Mm -hmm. out in the end. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, actually. Just to be like, yeah, Bill France, the France family still runs NASCAR. Yeah. Um, Bill France also insisted that the official like food of NASCAR is chili dog. Oh, he's nice. got a very specific recipe that if you're in like the uh, the infield of NASCAR, if you're like, OK, guys, VIP, if you're VIP at NASCAR, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a chili dog station with like very specific instructions on how to do this chili dog. Hmm. What is can you tell us or no uh, is it secret? I wish I could, but <laughs> it's sort of a NASCAR VIP secret. <laughs> Let's cast this movie. Let's cast this movie. This one is obviously a movie. Yeah. Um, I have some ideas. So first up, Raymond Parks. Who do we think? He's an older guy or no? Uh, he's not older, but I think he's older than the other two, Lee, L- Lloyd and Roy. I'm yeah. thinking Walter Goggins. Ooh. Ooh. Might be yeah. too funny looking. Yeah, but he's, but he's got a dream. He's got an idea. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now I'm telling you, Lord, I think that we are on to something here, man. 
Yeah, Walton you know. Goggins for sure. That Raymond son Parks. of a Bill France is doing his own race down in Daytona. You know, <laughs> um, Red is is Norman Reedus in my head. Who's Red Vot or vote Red yeah. Vote. Uh, I was thinking. Played, I was thinking like a Giovanni Rabisi. That's too small. Yeah, maybe that might be too. I was thinking McConaughey. Ooh. But well, we need someone who can hit that slightly racist tinge that we need. That's why I think Norman Reedus. Are we acknowledging the anti-Semitism? Yes, we have okay. to. Okay, all right. Yeah, Norman Reedus, he's he's evil looking. And I think M- McConaughey for Lloyd, maybe. That is too old. I'm thinking Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> I think that's too old. I think that's too old. These guys are like in their 20s. Okay, um... Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> that's how the about, only twenty year old. Guy you, how about a, like a Dylan Minnette from uh, uh, Thirteen Reasons? Who's the? Uh, no, that guy sucks. I like him. Who's the guy from Riverdale that plays Jughead? Zach and Cody. Yeah. You guys, what are you doing? What are we doing? Okay, we're going with Ryan Reynolds. For Lord he's State. so old for this. He's not so old for this. They're yes, old. he is. They're no. Who's they're what in their like twenties. They're in the twenties. None of these 30s. guys. None of these guys will retire. Nobody will retire. There's no young guys anymore. All the leading men now are 40, 40 years old. No, look, Cole Sprouse is a good uh, Roy Hall. Listen, I'm trying to make an Oscar bait movie here. All right. Oscar. I'm not casting off Netflix. I am. Well, I'm just going to bang young actors. And we'll what about see. Miles Teller? Too old. Miles Teller. Hmm. Too old? Uh, what about Tom Holland? Spider Man? Uh, we always bring up Tom Holland. Because he's like the only actor in his 20s. Yeah. Besides Timothy Chalamet. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. What about what about Will Poulter? I do like I I I really like Will Poulter. Who's that? Let's get him in there. You know who'd be a great red vote? I know we already talked about it. But hmm. Jesse Plemons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Jesse he's really Plemons. good at playing like a racist dude. <laughs> uh, I don't even want to do it anymore. I don't even like any of these actors. Yeah, well, because the only actors we know are Ryan Reynolds and Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> no, the only actors who are in le- like everyone plays twenty year olds when they're f- thirty five. Nolan, because it takes you that long to I, get there. I'm aware of that. So you want to change Hollywood on this? Ryan Reynolds podcast? is like fifty. No, he's not. He's old. Whatever. Okay, he's 44. Let's read some fucking email. All Guys, right, right. this casting is tearing us apart. <laughs> James is really uh, loyal to our boss, Ryan Reynolds. So Listen, oh, yeah. Ryan Reynolds is my boss, my mentor, okay? All right, let's read some listener emails. I'll start this one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So we got a couple emails to read. Uh, this one's from Trevor. He writes... Weekly listener and lover of the podcast here, Nolan is awesome, but his pronunciation of Lancia and Abarth was annoying. <laughs> Lancia is pronounced Lancia, and Abarth <laughs> is pronounced Abarth. Regardless, Abart. Abart. Oh, well, I guess I'm annoying then. And Abart is pronounced Abart. Regardless, still love the show. You know what? I wa- I wanted to read this one because I only read Nolan is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and I wanted to like deliver goodness, but then it took a 180 degree. It took a Art. it took a, a Lloyd a, C. Yeah, uh, moonshine yeah. turn. Moonshine turn. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Um, the first email we read is <laughs> hypercritical. <laughs> it's not hypercritical. I can take that. Look, the the thing is, is like one, I'm a Californian, so we already pronounce things strangely, and two, I'm an American, so we already we we mess up everything. Listen to James. <laughs> <laughs> like he's got a point it, it's just gonna happen i tried to hit it we we do our best to to hit the correct pronunciations on, yeah. in our videos and all of our stuff but it's, stuff is gonna slip through but uh thanks also, for i tweeted anyway, i tweeted about this the other day there are uh, you know four hundred thousand words in english if we pronounce one of them or two of them wrong if we pronounce one of them right you should be proud of us okay. well our next email is from raymond uh, he says, hello, I'm a regular listener and look forward to new episodes each week. I'm a cargo pilot that flies from Reno to L.A. and back nightly and love listening to the podcast on the flight. 
keeps me awake at all hours of the night and brings some entertainment to the cockpit. I especially enjoyed the Peking to Paris episode and the Ford Landia two-parter just this morning. I finished up the Indy 500 episode coming back into Reno. Anyway, thanks for the company in the cockpit. Keep it juiced, question mark? (laughs) Uh, my suggestion to raymond is check out the smoky uh eunuch episodes if you haven't already he had a a cargo flight business on the side when he was in the military (laughs) i'm not sure if that was sanctioned i don't i don't think i don't think uncle sam would have liked that keeping your company in the cockpit it's jody and the worm okay it's jody and the worm hey you fly boys out there it's jody and the worm keeping your company in the cockpit <laughs> keep it juiced in the cock cock cockpit <laughs> cock 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 uh, if you, uh, if you get want to oh, get in oh, touch oh. Uh, <laughs> email us at passgas at donutmedia.com uh, we'd love to hear from you guys i think i want to hear how we got stuff wrong and clarifications on some things I would love more criticism yeah. and clarifications for sure. If you notice anything if, that we left out or you want to expound on any of the topics yeah. that we've discussed, we'd, we'd love that. We're um, gluttons thanks. for punishment. Punish us, daddies. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your, your friends uh, about the show. Podcasts really are a medium that spreads by word of mouth. Follow Nolan uh, on all social media. And I mean all social media. All of it. Friendster. At Nolan, at Nolan Big Sykes. Meat. <laughs> follow Joe at Joe G Weber. Follow me at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut at Donut Media. I love you. Duh. <laughs> Duh.